As we journey through life, we all encounter ebbs and flows, many highs and lows. We often come across stumbling blocks that leave us feeling quite disheartened or unsure about how to move back to the realm of possibility and positivity. No matter what we undergo, we all can embrace the journey, tap into the tools to push through and overcome, and find the beauty in the ashes. This is Odyssey with Yendi, Beauty in the Ashes. Brought to you in partnership with MasterCard and Sagicor. Make online purchases in a safe way with Debit MasterCard. Let the passion of football find you everywhere. MasterCard, start something priceless. We're all in. Are you in? Yes, I'm in. Are you in? We're all in. It pays to be in Sajik World Bank bonus savings account. I'm in. It's a pooled savings account that pays you more. You get a bonus each month based on the total savings in the pool. Plus, you get your regular interest. We're all in. Together, everyone We're earns more. In. Open a Sajik World Bank bonus savings account today. Hi, Daddy. Hi, my darling. What's up? How are you? I'm fine. Glad to be here. I'm actually really glad you are here because I know that this is not the, the thing that you like. I know you don't love spotlight and camera lens. Not at all. And don't like to be in front of no camera. I, I know. But guess what? The camera's not there. It's me and you. We've got reason about life how we reason about life. All right. It's one cool. of our Wednesday morning, one of our phone calls. How about that? All right. That's, that's, that's can cool. Can I live with that? That's, can I live with that? <laughs> yeah. yes. um, I do feel, though, that your story is one that should be shared. I think that is one that all of us who are in your immediate circle, in your world, all you know, the people who even brush shoulders with mm. you are inspired by. Um, I feel like you make all of us a bit better. So I feel like it is one that everyone should hear. Well, I'm happy to hear you say that because it is the hope of every father that um, a daughter would emulate, or a son for that matter, would emulate what they do. Yeah. I know that it's, it makes life better. Mm -hmm. you know? For sure. Not many fathers get to, to do that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, you do a very good job at it, oh. I think. Oh, yeah, just, <laughs> I mean, I might be biased. <laughs> it's what the Lord wanted me to do, yeah. Yes, amen. Yes. It is. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about who Halim Phillips was as a young boy. What were you like? What was your personality <laughs> like? <laughs> Um, can we leave out the fart jokes? No, I won't. <laughs> I, w I won't mention that, I promise. Tell me. Um, growing up in Vineyard Town, um, my mother died when I was almost four. Yeah. And um, my father, sister Isaac, came to live with us, who taught me a ton of stuff about living the proper life, good morals. And, yeah. you know, um, I was the troublesome one in the house. Really? Always I into would never be oh, bad. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Always into mischief. <laughs> In fact, I was tagged the name Old Troublesome because mm -hmm. I'd break everything in the house <laughs> that could, from watches to clocks or whatever, mm -hmm. I'd break it. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess the values that was really instilled in me as a young child came from Aunt Icy. Um, she was a beautiful lady mm. and um, she came to join my father with four children, with her three children. Yeah. And um, one of the most poignant things she taught me as a young boy was this little phraseology, uno vi no va, and uno va no vi. Hmm. It simply meant, you know, in their terms, who don't ask, don't want, and who don't ask, don't get. Hmm. So if you don't, if you don't ask about things, nobody can read your heart, nobody can read your mind. So yeah. therefore, it can either be a yes or a no. Hmm. And I've lived that value my whole life. Hmm. A word, daddy. But I did lost my way along the way. You? you know? Yes, of course. Oh, never. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know, it's it's. You said it so casually that somebody might not even clue into what you say, but losing your mother at almost four years old. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you have like vivid frontal memories of that change in your life or your life just was, was it just was what it was without her? Well, there was a great void, I must be honest, because yeah. I was her pet. Right. You know, she had four kids and I'm the only one that got the Lebanese name. Right. And so there must have been something innate inside of her right. that made me want to have this name. Um, so Halim is the name she gave me. Um, it means dreamer. Yes. That's what it means. 
And I'm a bit of a dreamer, uh, yes. I am a bit of a dreamer. But um, Aunt Icy really came in and um, made sure that all of us were treated the same way in the right. house. Yeah. Her kids and our, our, his kids were not two different set of kids, but they were one set of kids. Mm. Um, somewhere around 58, 59, my father got married again. And Valerie, my stepmother, came to live in the house. Um, and things were a little bit topsy-turvy then, but yeah. the, the ship was very uneasy for quite a while, yeah. you know, but we managed to, to step the tide, yeah. you know, and we all grew up in a rough way, you know. We moved from Vineyard Town in um, 59, went to live in Norman Road, off South Camp Road, and uh, we were exposed to other families around the same compound, yeah. you know, and um, I went to St. George's College. Wasn't a dunce, but I was a very bad boy in school and I didn't make it through St. George's College. Yeah. I got expelled. Um, I went to KTHS and um, that's where I really honed myself and found myself. You really? Know. Yes. Was it at Kingston Tech? It was at Kingston Tech that I found myself mm. because as a young child, I broke everything in the house. Right. That could, was mechanical, I broke it. So at technical school, I was able to do technical stuff. You learned to fix it. I learned to fix things ah. and not break things anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. you know. So um, that was where I really found myself. Yeah. I had skills that I didn't even know I had at an academic high school mm -hmm. where I could do engineering drawing, which I was very good at. I did woodwork, metal work, welding, electrical. I did a lot of stuff that I could find within all of that to find a niche that yeah. I would be good at, yeah. you know, I would be excel at, yeah. you know, um, yeah. There, something happened in your world Something happened where some would say you went a bit wayward. Some mm -hmm. would say you went down a path that was just the path that no one in your family saw coming. No yeah. one else in your family went down that path. What was the thing that triggered you and what was that path that you went down? Well, I think that path began when I was about 13, 14. I had a very good friend in school, Kenny Diane. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind me calling his name. Yeah, He's no. a beautiful guy. We're in the same position in life. Um, we both had stepmothers and fathers who drank. Yeah. And so at about 13, 14, he lived at Doncaster off Windward Road. I started smoking herb. And I found that when I came home from school under some herb, as we used to call it, mm -hmm. I felt no pain, as Bob Marley would say. Mm. When there were upheavals in the house, it meant nothing to me. It, yeah. it, it went out my back like nothing, you know? And um, I went away when I was 19 to join my brother who lived in Canada, Herbie, my eldest brother. And the change for me came, it was a culture shock, really. Yeah. Because in Jamaica, I'm just a Jamaican boy. Mm -hmm. You know, my heritage didn't matter. My skin complexion didn't matter. My culture didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But when I came to Canada, I found out that I was a misfit. Mm -hmm. I was neither black, I wasn't white. Mm -hmm. So I didn't fit the black culture, I didn't fit the white culture. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in no man's land. Mm -hmm. And I began to really rebel. And it reflected on a lot of things that I did. Um, I tried to join the Black Power Movement that Bobby Seale founded in, 19, um, in the 60s. I didn't fit there either because when they were having their meetings, I had to leave the room. I wasn't black enough for their meetings. Mm. So it really hit me hard. You know, the, the culture was very strong. So where I found solace was in Rastafarianism. Mm -hmm. So I began to walk that walk. Um, grow your locks. Yes, I grew my locks. Flash your nutty. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Sport um, your tam. Judge my tam, not sport, judge. Excuse me. Me not sport, me judge. Stand corrected. Yes, <laughs> yeah. you know, judge my tam and try not me here and my hair started to grow. I had a very big afro at the time. Because mm -hmm. afro was an in thing mm -hmm. with, that, with that Bobby Seal Black Panther movement. You had to wear afro, as they call it, afro. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Oh, I just realized that. Afro. Yes, afro. Did you realize that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. I started the locks by here. And then I was okay in Canada because it was new to Canada and there was a fad out of, um, out of that era in, in North America where um, the flower power was in mm -hmm. progress. Band Young kids were moving along, ban the bomb, yes, ban the bomb. And you begin to really rebel, you know. And, yeah. um, but when I came home, my family wasn't kosher with that. Mm. 
you know, my daddy was out of his wits with that, that I would be a Rasta man. And he said, don't come where I am, you know what I mean? So it was a bit of an upheaval time in my life. Um, I went through um, 11 years of that, you know, 11 years of trying to find myself to who I really was, mm. where, I, where did I fit? But it was, a, it was a secular thing. It was a worldly thing, mm. you know, you trying mean? to fit into the world. Ah, with you. You know, um, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't, I was, just wasn't fitting. I wasn't fitting in anything. Mm -hmm. Because when I came to Jamaica on my break from Canada, I went to many Rasta camps, Boba Dread camp in, in St. Thomas, mm -hmm. Tafari camp, 12 tribe up a Hope Road. Mm -hmm. And just not, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to, but it does not go in, you know. Mm -hmm. it really wasn't fitting in. At the two weeks, I was having tremendous difficulty with the winters in, in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. I spent four years in Montreal, and then I got transferred in my job to Toronto, where I got a promotion and I, it was just as cold as Montreal was. I, I struggled in the winter time, yeah. badly. I struggled with uh, the cold itself, and the winter has been so long, you get depressed. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just wasn't cutting. I, was, I just wasn't making it. After 11 years, I said I wasn't making it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I came home one winter. It was the winter of 78, 79. And um, something happened really big, you know. So, my family had a supermarket on Redders Road. My Uncle John, God rest his soul, he was the one that said I was really like in person, mm -hmm. personality, you know. Um, <laughs> and they had a supermarket on Redders Road, and I used to go there frequently to visit him and to visit my, my cousin Jeannie, who was my best friend, somebody I confided a lot of things in my lifetime. And um, one day while I was there, this lady came in the store, you know. Your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, I tell you, she was one fine, fine lady, you know. Oh, you sound like you was going to say something else. <laughs> no, she was a fine you lady. It. <laughs> and um, she had this pretty little foot, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm foot fetish. You know, I, I like women with fine feet. If you don't have fine feet, I ain't looking no further. <laughs> You know, <laughs> no, it's not. Sure. Yeah, gypsy's too, so don't worry about it. Gypsy's his mummy. <laughs> um, and um, after talking to her about maybe half an hour, forty minutes, I blocked her. I said something to her that was kind of off the charts. No you know? man, tell me what you said to her, man. Come and love that story. <laughs> what you said to her? I said to her, and I was like, I need to be I'm on queen. <laughs> I wanted her to be my queen, and she's a like, queen. I said, yes, you know, I know I want the I to be Iron Man Queen. And she said, she laughed, I said, ha, ha, ha. And, you know, you know, fluffed me off, you know. Uh -huh. And about maybe 10 minutes after she said, listen, I don't know where you're coming from, but what an intelligent man like you doing, destroy your life the way you are. You need to find yourself. But if you clean up your life, I might deal with you. Just so. Just so. Just so. So, well, <laughs> Why, the same evening I went to the barber shop in, <laughs> in, Liga, in, um, in um, Manor Park. Manor Park, Manor Park. <laughs> was but, trim me. It was lot of barbers in the name of the place. Uh -huh. And I cut my hair. The, same, the very same evening. And then I, when I went home and I had the locks, you know, and thing, and I looked in the mirror to how I stay. Not like I am today with, you know, slightly balding and stuff. <laughs> and... The spirit said to me, you know, where is your life really going? Mm -hmm. What have you achieved in 31 years? And the answer was nothing. You really are nothing. You're smoking a quarter pound a weed a week or more. You touch a little opium every now and then. But your life wasn't really going anywhere. And that made me start to look at myself, look to the inner person that's in me. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a tough journey. Rehab was very tough. Um, she saw me through rehab. Um, I didn't go into rehab. I never entered a, a facility. an institution to rehab. Um, my cold turkey days were hard. You know, withdrawal from the weed and from... And um, on the 10th of April, I was coming from Gunboat Beach. And I was about to light a Dumarie cigarette. 
And she said to me, you really need that? I said, not really, you know. Here is the MasterCard priceless moment. So on April the 10th was my sobriety day, 1979. No drugs, no cigarettes, no alcohol. And it was a rough journey, a very rough journey. Very, very rough journey. Do you think you did it for mommy? Or did you do it because of what the spirit moved you to do that day? The finding of yourself? Well, the question she posed to me. Right, made you think. Made me, as Michael Jackson said, the man in the mirror speaks to you. Right, yes, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And when the man in the mirror speaks to you, you better respond. That's right. You ought to, I should say, respond. Um, because the truth is what sets you free. Mm, daddy, a yeah. word. The truth is what sets you free. A word. And um, it was a bit of a trade-off in terms of um, what it was because I started going back to church with her at the Holy Cross and we got married in September, the same year, 79. By the way, Three months later, I'm just saying, when you know, you know, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got married at seven o'clock, waiting in the night. People don't get married in the night because, uh -huh. because it's against the law. So we had to get dispensation for that. But uh, we got married and um, I got cleaned up. She had a very bad endometriosis. Couldn't have any children with our previous marriage. And here we are. We have we got Dion first, our eldest. And we got you. Hmm? And your life has never been the same no, it's never since been the I same. came, right? Just tell them. Never been the same. <laughs> <laughs> since, since both of you came. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that I will tell you about the change in my life and the strong change that came. Every time that Dion would give me trouble as a young boy, I remember the moment. 20 after 9, the moment he was born that morning, Wednesday morning, a little crushed up, thinking about our abdomen. Mm -hmm. And I would never really wanted to knock him out, <laughs> right? That's what I remember, and I, I can't do what I'm supposed to really do. Yeah. But, but what all of this did for me was two things. It made me realize that there was somebody inside of me who was a family man, mm -hmm. who could give love easily, and readily, without, without, without it being reciprocal, you know. Secondly, it taught me that Jesus is alive and well and rocks the earth. Because I couldn't have done all this without Jesus mm -hmm. and without the Holy Spirit playing a very important role in my life. Yeah. Um, it was not easy road, like it wasn't an easy road mm -hmm. because there was many a tear yeah. between births and after births. Mm -hmm. um, there was many a heartache. Um, there was sickness, yeah. you know, and there was ill health along the way, yeah. which we had to cope with. Um, having the children in the home at Hope Boulevard really was something that also brought something out in me that I didn't know was in me either. The kids all came to Hope Boulevard House. Yeah. All the kids the in the neighborhood. Yeah. And they were all coming to one person. Yeah. Halim. And it's so funny because you were a fairly strict parent, but you were also the cool parent. So yeah. you were the one that we could all talk to about everything and anything. And you wouldn't spaz out. You were the one that, you know, I remember even some of our friends and parents would be having issues in their homes and they'd come and reason with you. Yes. You would be a pseudo True. dad True. to those in the community that never had their dad in their home. Yeah. Um, but don't play with your neither, you know. We say, let me tell you about my father. When he's ready to get oh. firm, you know. But he, you, you, you balance that so well, dad. You are, you're so good at, you command respect, but you are kind and gentle and loving and compassionate and the person that will pray for you before anything else, you know. Well, it's what we are called to do, you know. Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I will never liken myself unto Christ. 
because he was the ultimate, the ultimate sacrifice that was made for humanity. Yeah. But they are, take Moses for example. Moses was called, Moses grew up an Egyptian, but he was Hebrew. But in his belly, he knew he was Hebrew. Mm. And Moses found himself in the wilderness where the Lord called him to the mountain to, to be given the mandate to go and free the people of Israel. Mm. Moses was obedient. So this is what the Lord has called all of us to be, to live like the way those leaders lived. Mm. Moses was a very stern man, you know. Mm. Remember him cussed a lot of them when he read you know? <laughs> Yeah. I remember when he came off of the mountain with, with the tablets, yeah. the commandments, and they were worshiping that, that calf, a golden calf. Mm. Him destroy them you know, and him call damnation down upon them. So Moses was a like, kind leader. But no nonsense. But no nonsense. Mm. And so was the Lord. The Lord rebuked a lot of people, but he was kind in healing and kind in bestowing miracles upon people. Mm. Mm. It's what we are called to do as people. It's funny that you mention obedience because one of the things that I hold you in highest esteem for is the example that you are as a husband. I am, um, I vividly remember, I don't even know if you remember this, but I remember I was about 13 and on our street, a lot of people were getting divorced and separated. Yes, that's true. You remember this conversation yes. or not yet? I remember. And I remember we were driving, it was just you and I in the car and I said to you, are you and mommy going to get divorced? And you were like, no, what kind of question is that? And then I said to you, I said, have you ever cheated on mommy? Mm -hmm. You remember yeah, me asking I, you that? I remember. And I remember distinctly you said to me, you were like, no, I wouldn't cheat on your mother. I wouldn't look anywhere else because I made a commitment to your mother, but I made a sacrament with God. And it has never left me that you said that. Your, the fact that you wanted to honor your sacrament with God was yes. so important to you. Let's talk a bit about that. Let's talk about the way you honor your wife. And I would actually say wives, because in losing mommy, I think God blessed you a second oh, time God. over he with sure my stepmom, who is amazing. She's but, so amazing. But before we go there, let's talk a bit about that, your approach to marriage, because you never saw a healthy example in no. your home no, of I what didn't. marriage looked I didn't. like. I didn't. So where, what, what, what's the source of that for you, Dad? All right. Let's go back to my childhood. Yeah. And then I go from there quickly. Um... My dad was an abusive father. Yeah. Okay. And he was the most beautiful person when the fire water wasn't in his belly. Mm -hmm. He drank and they, he couldn't manage it. But I vowed to myself that was never going to be me. I was never going to be like him or like them. You know? Now, when... When Adjus and I came together, when Sasa and I came together, that's your mom. I, yes, yeah? dad. <laughs> um... I saw a covenant being made between God and two people. She couldn't have children. And B, I was a drug addict. I was, addic I was an addicted person. Um, we both got healed. We both got healed. And therefore, the covenant was God in the middle. One person, another person, and God in the middle. And therefore, if I ever dishonored that covenant with God, I'd be punished. That's what I felt. Right. I'd be punished. Okay? That's one. Two, because of the unhealthy situations that I, that I grew up in, where my father was always womanizing, I never wanted to be in that boat either. Mm -hmm. And then also, in our generation, your mother's and my generation, there were divorces left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. and marriage was a damn joke, you know, really yeah. joke, you know. People were divorced for the simplest of things, you know. I was going to stick to my covenant. Mm -hmm. That decree that I made with the Lord, and the Lord made with me and with her, but I was going to maintain that decree. Mm -hmm. And that is why when, when she got ill for those nine, last nine years of her life, I was able to look after her and care her Listen, the way I did. You guys don't even understand It is such a humbling and beautiful thing to behold. And I am 
it, the, it's not lost on me the blessing that it is that I bore witness to you, literally nursing mommy, wiping her clean, bathing her, yeah. taking care of her, oh, yes. tending to her. You know, it's that it, you, most men not doing that. You know that. <laughs> A lot of men do that, yes. A lot of men do you do that. So? Yes, I do. There are a lot of good men left on this earth, Amira. Yeah. A lot of good men. Um, it is just about trusting in the Lord, knowing that he has called you to something that he wants to test you. You see, Christianity is one thing, where the church is one thing, but knowing what the Lord, the example of the Lord has set for us, and if we are his, really his followers, we're going to follow what he teaches us. Right. right. Yeah. And the Lord gives you small things to entrust you with, to give you greater things after. Mm, a word. After. Mm -hmm. So, if I just walked away as I was, it was suggested to me to walk away. It was. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. What would I really be in terms of what the Lord had done for me? Yes. And the blessing that was brought into your life yes. through her. And it's because of all of that, after her passing, the Lord allowed me to mourn for a time, yeah. but then he brought back joy into my life. Do you remember that mommy really wanted you to find a companion and happiness? Absolutely. She was a very unselfish person. I remember that totally. so clearly. Yeah. It was a day she had the bleed, yes. the liver accident. Yeah. And she was in, on her way to the theatre. Yes, and she reached for each of us. And she spoke to each of us collectively and individually. Yes. And the thing she said to me, don't end up like your father, a lost and lonely man living in an alcohol bottle. Yeah, she says, you have a good heart. You're a very kind man. There is somebody out there for you who's going to bless your life again. Yeah. That was her last words to me, actually. Do you know what her last words to me were? No, you tell me. Mommy's last words to me were, I love you very much, but this is it. Take care of Daddy and Dion for me, because this is it. I love you. See? So she had a message for all of us, right? Yeah. So is that faithfulness to a covenant, A, eh? And in 97, when I gave my life to Jesus, and I was baptized, water baptized, in the Holy Spirit, that my life really began to really change, yeah. you know. Um, I began to feel that I was worth something in terms of the work that I did in the church. Yes. In the work I did at home as a, as a family man, as a godly man. Um, yeah, those are the things that made... Even the work you did in ministry, because the ministering to the young men and, yeah. you know, how active you are in your church community. Yeah. Listen, um, I think Hope Boulevard was the, the, the home where all the kids in the neighborhood came. Yeah. Um, you remember I was King of Mario, right? Oh! I was King of Mario. He was so good at Mario. No kid in Hope Boulevard at could beat Mario. At the golf game. Oh, golf, remember? baseball, <laughs> boxing, right? And Mario. <laughs> and so it, that was the catalyst for the young men. Yeah. They wanted to beat me. Yeah. But in playing the game together, we talked about life. That's right. And we talked about the values of life. Yeah. And we talked about where they want to go. Yeah. And what they, what they want to achieve in life. You know, and... I was able to nurture yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Most of Dion's friends. It's kind of uncanny, you know, that a lot of these young men, Debbie will tell you, birthday, my birthday comes and the text come in. From the whole crew. From yeah, the crew. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Duet Boy was one that remained faithful to me. Corey. Boy, think, yes. <laughs> Duet Boy never missed Christmas or birthday. Not Duet Sarani. Boy. <laughs> we call yeah, him Duet yeah. Boy. I mean, I mean, no, he was Corey. But yeah, yeah. We love the name Duet Boy. You know what is so funny how you <laughs> mentioned Serrani? But Serrani, so Craig was Serrani to us before he was Serrani to the world. Yes. Because we used to call him by his middle name, not his Christian name. Yeah. And look how that come now to be his stage, stage name. name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Timothy Tweets. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, Young Wright. What's the first name? Earl. Again? Earl Wright. Yes. yes. Earl. Earl Wright. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and many more. Yeah. And many more. Um, think that two boys up the road. Mark Gregory. Yes. There are a lot of them. Russell. Yes. <laughs> and so that is where it really began. And so I began working with the charismatic Catholics and I had the young groups to, to earn the young men, the young groups. Yeah. So the Lord has really worked through me. You know, um, it has nothing to do with me. I just avail myself to the Spirit of God. You know, and um, not long after your mother passed, a couple of years, maybe two, three years, I met Debbie at the NCB. <laughs> oh boy. So with the first wife, it was the feet. But with Debbie, it was the hair. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my office one afternoon late in May, and there was a meeting in the back office to, down from where I, I sat. And I saw this head of hair go by. Mm -hmm. Oh my word. Lush head of hair, you know. Ooh. <laughs> Tell me now. <laughs> yeah. And so I made a note in my diary. Did you? Yes. What the note said? <laughs> I said, a young lady came to my department this afternoon and she made my eyes look. Oh, not yeah. the lyrics. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she made my eyes look. And you know, I saw her that day. Yeah. We worked on the same building. Didn't know what floor she worked on or what department she worked in for five months. Four, five months, I never saw her. And um, I went off on vacation. Daddy was having surgery. And I went off a few weeks vacation and came back and she came and sat right at my desk with some bills from one of the providers that provided service for NCB. Right. Yeah. That's how I met Debbie. And it's now been how many years of marriage? Well, I know Debbie 17 years and I've been married 15 years to Debbie. 15 years plus. And you were married for how many years to mommy? 23 years. So, 23 years of marriage where death separated you yeah. and now 15 years of marriage 17 years of courtship then is how you once are blessed <laughs> it is very simple what how simple is it daddy wherever the lord lead you you're obedient to go mm. whatever task the lord give you do it diligently mm. do it diligently he wants you to be diligent and he wants you to be obedient and whatever you do don't do it with any ulterior motive or any inner motive. Do it from your heart. And things will just flow into your life. Debbie has been a tremendous blessing to, to my life and to your life. Absolutely. And to many more people's lives. She has a spirit that glows. Mm -hmm. And she has a heart of gold. And she, Absolutely. She kind of, she kind, she kind, she kind. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> She's kind, kind, kind. I tell you, kind. She'll give you a shirt her last her meal mm -hmm. and leave herself hungry. Do you know a story that you probably don't know? And I don't even know if Debs remembers this, but I'm going to tell you this story. It was your wedding day. And we were at the hotel getting ready. And I packed so poorly, I forgot my toothbrush. Do you know that my stepmom is getting ready, having her makeup done and doing what she's doing. And my stepmom said, just, no, 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 just use mine. It's fine. And I thought to myself, she don't even scorn me. <laughs> I'm like, wow, not somebody who, whose blood does not run through my veins, mm -hmm. but literally demonstrating immediately unconditional love. Yes. You know, not yeah. to say that it's a, a marker or measure of anything, but the fact that she could just say yes. to me, it was a, what is mine is yours. Yes. You, we are. That is Debbie. We might as well had just been flesh of flesh. Of course. You know what I mean? It was just so. I remember in that moment pausing and saying, "How kind, how thoughtful." I'm not an outsider for her. No. I am in, and it felt lovely. It mm. felt lovely, and and what I love is that Debs never came in trying to mother us. She immediately became our friend. And it was beautiful because I was 21 years old at that mm -hmm. point, right? Um, and it's been, 
I've, I think I have been tremendously blessed with exceptional exemplary women in my moms, but also in you. I think my parental system has been really healthy. And I know I've fallen short. I know I've I know there have been areas where I have let you guys down or you felt a little bit disappointed in me, but the support... Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Forgiveness is very important in all of this. Yeah. And that's the beauty of Jesus. He forgave the sinner beside him on the cross. Yeah. That's the example he set through. So all of us are not perfect. Only he was perfect. We all fall short. And we all fall short of the glory of God. But there is forgiveness. Yeah. And there is inner healing. Yeah? Very important. Yeah. Very important. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> no. Cry if you want to cry. You know. But I would say to this young generation coming up. Yeah. And young married men and, and women. You have to know that when you get married, you enter into a covenant with God. It's not a covenant between you and a woman. It is a covenant, yes, but at the center of your relationship is God. And God is watching you. God says, I give you a bride. I give you a husband. Let's see how you handle this. And it's important that you know that the examples that you and whatever you do in that relationship, you're going to be judged. The Lord, as I said earlier, will give you small things to start you out with, to see how you handle it. And the Bible says, better a little, in mm -hmm. Proverbs, mm -hmm. yeah, better a little with happiness than much with unhappiness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is what life is. Life is a stage that you go through at all levels of life. And you grow spiritually, and in growing spiritually, you grow emotionally, and you grow physically. What do you say to the person who is watching, who is struggling with addiction? There is hope for addiction, to get out of addiction. It's not impossible. Um, it's not an easy road. Um, cold turkey is terrible. You go crazy if you're not careful. Um, they have developed approaches to, um, to getting clean from a psychiatric point of view, from a psychology point of view. And some of them work, some of them don't work. But I can tell any young person out there, or any person with addiction, if you put God at the center of your life, He will see you through. And He'll also help you to be strong in rising up above the miry clay that you're in. Because addiction is like the Mary clay, you're stuck, you can't move. Mm -hmm. And only the Holy Spirit of God and His strength and His, you got to keep your eye on that prize, mm -hmm. will bring you from that Mary clay into His light and His glory. Mm. I didn't do this on my own. It had to be Him. It had been nobody but the Holy Spirit who brought me through my time. Yeah. And through all these years that I've struggled and, and the Lord has elevated me at each level that I've come to in life. You know, um, as you know, we recently migrated to the States, as you know. And when we both got there, we knew only Debbie's dad. And we had to get jobs. We, most of the jobs that were available required you to have American experience. So you got to start somewhere at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So we started both at the bottom in retail. And it wasn't long before the Lord elevated us into government mm -hmm. jobs. Because he started out with a small amount, like a mustard seed. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, like a, like, like a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And that mustard seed, when you plant it, it grows into a huge tree. Mm -hmm. So that is what it's all about. Trusting in God, knowing that his deliverance is real. Mm -hmm. And that you will overcome all that is encumbering you in life. But you must trust and believe and obey. Mm. And, and strive within him. 
knowing that he is the author and the finisher of our lives. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Daddy, what do you want your legacy to be? I don't know, legacy? Uh, <laughs> well, what do you want to be remembered for the most? That I was a loving father and husband and that I gave my heart to all who came in contact with me. I just didn't give them a piece of me. I'm not a piecemeal person. I always teach you when you're young something. You remember that? I always teach you? Tell me what it is. You remember? I do. I am either a fish or a fowl. I'm never going to be a fishy fowl in life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never going to be a fishy fowl. Yeah. What you see is what you get. Yeah. You have to be authentic. True word that, you know. Mm. True word. Talk um, truth. You know, authentic. You, you figure out leg about legacy. Um, Bob Marley didn't know what his legacy was going to be. You're right. Um, Jamaicans didn't know what Bob Marley's legacy was going to be. But the world knew first, mm. amazingly. Mm. We didn't know the true value of the culture of what Marley was telling us. Mm -hmm. But the Japanese did, and the Germans did, and the British did, and the Americans did before we did. Mm. Um, but you don't really think about what legacy you're going to leave. You just live your life as the Lord wants you to live it. Mm -hmm. And your legacy will be set. That's right. That's right. Just how the Lord wants you to be. That's right. It will be set. You don't set your own legacy. Yeah. The yeah. Lord creates your legacy for you. Oh, a word, yeah. Daddy. A yeah. word. If there is one thing that you could say to your grandchildren, what would that be? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I have two grandchildren now, Izzy and Amir, who I call Ampi. <laughs> um, I have kind of said something for them already. They know I'm a comedian. Oh my gosh, Israel is always asking about the fart gun. Oh. <laughs> is your best friend, is it or not me? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's had to come up. Is your biggest friend, is it or not me? <laughs> um, no. He's such a big kid, you guys, trust yes. me. Yes. Um, and he always said to me that when the child in you dies, is when you die. Absolutely. Always keep the child in you alive. Abs absolutely. Yeah. That child in all of us. Yeah. But this child is still 10 years old. <laughs> um, for the grandchildren, my hope is that Adrian, you, and Dion, when he gets his children, will tell them about the goodness of Jesus. A, and that their grandfather was a man that believed in God and strived only to please God and that their grandfather was a big child. It's not for me to teach them, it's for you guys to tell them and that your grandfather was a loving, kind, caring person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it and yeah. so much more. Do you guys know that my father's initials spell the word help? <laughs> and it is one of your greatest qualities, Daddy. You are the most selfless human being I have ever encountered in my life. Thank and for you, a man Amira. who don't have much, but has everything. It's amazing. I've never, my biggest lesson in you don't need to have material wealth. No, you don't. To have spiritual wealth, emotional yeah. wealth, peace, joy, understanding. Yeah. The, I mean, the nicest wife in life, is showered <laughs> with love, family. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a great example. It's a great example. And I thank you, Daddy. No problem. Well, you know, um, help is something that we all need. Um, the Lord didn't come here and measure everything he did. He just did it. Mm -hmm. um, the great people of the Bible, as told to us in Hebrews 11, um, tells you that they were, they were selfless. Yeah. They were all selfless, but they believed. And they were diligent in what they do. Um, but it is very important to know that a name is important. Mm -hmm. You know, people give their kids all kinds of names and think it's pretty. Because the world is what, what the world is doing. Because that's what's spoken over you every day of your life. Yeah. Yeah. But um, 
I derive great pleasure and blessings from helping others. Yeah. And um, it will always be that way. Yeah. You know, always be that way. You are a really good daddy. Really? Yes. Choo choo. Choo 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 choo. <laughs> a very, very good daddy. Uh, and a better daddy God could not have given me. Thank you, Missy. Thank you. And Come I on. mean that. Mm. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for having me, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Brought to you by MasterCard and Sagicore. Make online purchases in a safe way with Debit MasterCard. Let the passion of football find you everywhere. MasterCard, start something priceless. Are you in? We're all in? It pays to be in Sagic World Bank bonus savings account. I'm in. It's a pooled savings account that pays you more. You get a bonus each month based on the total savings in the pool. Plus, you get your regular interest. We're all in. Together, everyone earns more. Open a Sagic World Bank bonus savings account today.